Hello and welcome to Big Talk with Todd and Noah, presented by Xfinity. We are back with another week after, uh, I would say, chilly night at Yankee yeah. Stadium. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you regained feeling in all of your extremities? Yeah, I mean, my fingertips were a little numb for uh, for a while, but, um, you know, and the fact that the game was so out of hand, you know, did not help the warmth factor either, you know, <laughs> by the time we were into the fourth quarter, but... It was a great experience, you know. I've never been to Yankee Stadium, so that was kind of a thrill to to, to be in that building. And uh, you know, the lead up to our game, the build up of our game was fantastic. And uh, you know, we kind of knew and could see early on that it was not going to be a good uh, competitive battle, even though it was fourteen to seven for a period of time. Um, you know, Notre Dame is they they were clearly clearly a more dominant team and. You know, Army was in a little bit over their heads in that one, but uh, still have a chance to have a great season. But meanwhile, for Notre Dame, they just continue to roll along. And, you know, I think they're playing better and better on both sides of the ball. So uh, they're playing their best football right now when it matters the most. 1,000%. A big win for them. You said the buildup to our game, that just didn't include the aspect of our matchup. But earlier in the day, that included a top five matchup between yeah. Ohio State and Indiana. So many yeah. questions going into this one. How would Indiana fare against the legitimate powerhouse? And early on in the game, it, se it seemed that they were going to be in great shape. But Ohio State eventually stepped on the throat and yeah. really cruised to a victory. Yeah, you know, Ohio State's defense really ever since the Oregon game that they lost uh, in game six that we saw, they've been a different kind of defense. And they've been more aggressive. They've been more attacking, uh, more sacks, more tackles for loss. They made life miserable for Curtis Rourke, who had played unbelievably all year, right? And in that game, eight for 18, only 68 yards passing, no touchdowns. Uh, you know, they had five sacks. So this was uh, a dominant performance by the Ohio State defense. They had a punt return for a touchdown. Their offense was efficient. Will H Howard, you know, is doing a nice job of running the running the show throwing it and running it. Um, it, it was a, an impressive and dominant performance by Ohio State. No question about it, and they will certainly reap the rewards of that. They were number two coming in. They'll stay at number two, but also yeah. keep themselves very much in position for a rematch now in the Big Ten Championship yeah. should they take care of their business in this final week of the regular season. Number four, Penn State. I know that you were watching this game yeah. with a lot of anticipation as it was unfolding. Minnesota, we had talked about last week, was going to be a challenge for the Nittany Lions. Yeah. They certainly posed that challenge, but Penn State makes enough plays down the stretch in the fourth quarter to hold them off by one. Yeah, and I think Penn State, I, I said this going into the game, I felt like Penn State is playing their best football at the right time of the year as well. Um, defensively and offensively. Uh, I thought, you know, their win at home against Washington, the whiteout was a really good game, a complete win, yep. win against UCLA. Uh, you know, I think that they have been playing really well. And now Minnesota, I knew this would be a tough game. Minnesota always plays them tough. They're a physical team. It was on the road. And um, I thought Penn State was impressive, particularly at the end, you know, and, and you know, James Franklin, who at times has not always been the best game manager i don't think but i thought he made some great decisions they went for it to decide with a one-point lead you know pj flex settled for a field goal so after a goal line stand and a field goal brought minnesota to within one uh penn state went on a drive that ate up the last part of the fourth quarter five minutes and 38 seconds they went for three times they went for it on fourth down one was a fake punt where they direct snapped it to a true freshman tight end who ran 32 yards uh you know so I was impressed. Then they had a, a – Drew Aller had a conversion and then a pass completion uh, to Tyler Warren, who had another huge game, eight yeah. catches for over 100 yards. So uh, I thought on the road that was an impressive win. You know, just like we talked about when Oregon beat Wisconsin, uh, it wasn't – you know, it wasn't a blowout. It maybe wasn't the best they could play offensively, but they found a way to win in a tough environment on the road – uh, when they beat the Badgers 16-13. And I think this win, even though it was, you know, by one point, uh, was an impressive win for Penn State. You can make the argument that style points matter this time of year, but realistically, the win is what's most important. And, and the fact that they got it done, yeah. you know, you might not say that Penn State teams in the past would have gotten it done, would have ran through the tape 
quite the way that this right. team did. So give them credit. They stay very much in their picture of the college football playoff landscape, and we'll see what it looks like. Again, we're recording this early in the week before the, the new rankings come out. So we'll take a look and, and see what happens with Penn State and Notre Dame, for that matter. I know we mentioned yeah. them at the very top as they get set for uh, this week. And then the last ranked team that was in action in the Big Ten this week, this was the beginning of the day of our triple header on NBC and Peacock. And this game was awesome. Yeah. Illinois, crazy touchdown in the final seconds on fourth and forever yeah. to take down Rutgers in really excruciating fashion. Yeah, I mean, this game would have been thrilling for everybody to watch except our partner, Catherine Tapp. I'm sure <laughs> yeah. it was excruciating for her. But, I mean, if you're a fan and like exciting action, this was a heck of a game to watch and to start off your college football Saturday. And you mentioned the, the crazy play on fourth and forever. They actually lined up to kick a field goal. Yep. And Greg Schiano called timeout right at you know before the play was counted but they had tried the kick and it was way short and off to the side and i think at that point brett bielema says we're not close enough to try this field goal there's 14 seconds left no timeouts and i just read this today you know i didn't know this part of it i saw the highlights of the touchdown catch by pat bryant but supposedly the play that was called was a play they practiced to get the completion to go down immediately get up on the ball and spike it with no timeouts to be have a shorter field goal attempt. And Pat Bryant saw an opening and decided to keep running with the ball and ended mm. up turning it into a touchdown that ultimately won the game. So uh, incredibly heads up play by him. He had another huge game, nine catches or seven catches, season high, 197 yards. Uh, Kyle Manangai ran the ball really well for Rutgers. So again, a lot of action. Uh, you know, the Greek rifle threw for two, ran for two, a lot of action in this game, but what a crazy finish. Field goal was from 58 yards away. Yeah. And as said, that first attempt that Shiano decided to ice was way off, as Mike Breen would say, or he would say, way off. And then, you know, <laughs> you'd feel really bad about yourself when you go back and watch the TV copy. Couple of teams that clinched bowl eligibility. Todd Stradamus has finally come true. Finally. Nebraska yeah. has finally come through. For you, Todd, this year, this was a reversal of the game we did last year. Wisconsin last season won in overtime over Nebraska at home. This time in Lincoln, it is the Huskers 44-25 yeah. for their sixth win. Yeah, an impressive win, you know, and I'm sure the home crowd finally could take a deep breath and sigh and say, finally, we did it. We, we've ended yeah, this. After they, after they stormed the field. Yeah, after the storm. so, many, so many field stormings. Some of them not, last <laughs> week and not even – with time still on the clock. And Arizona, True, good point. Right? So I, some people don't even know how to storm the field or when to storm the field. But Nebraska did. I, I thought it was cute, too, that Matt Rule said, this is the last time we will celebrate a sixth win. Yeah. And, you know, I hope he's right, you know, for his sake. But, uh, but yeah, it's, this was crazy, right? So Wisconsin comes into the game. They had just fired their offensive coordinator. Nebraska comes in. It's the second full game with Dana Holgerson as the new offensive coordinator. Both teams gained over 400 yards of offense. Both quarterbacks threw just under 300 yards of passing yards. But uh, the difference really was Rutger, or, uh, Nebraska ran the ball with a lot more success than Wisconsin did. So they had more total yards, they had more ball control. And uh, to score 44 points is pretty impressive for them. So a uh, big win for them. Um, and again, not only did they not only did they become bowl eligible for the first time in however long, they also stopped a four-game losing streak. I mean, they right. had lost four games in a row coming into that game. And it was the first time in the last 11 meetings that they have beaten Wisconsin also. So a lot accomplished by the Cornhuskers last Saturday. No question. Now Wisconsin back to the drawing board for this final week. They've got to win to keep that bowl streak alive. They've got to find a way to get to that sixth victory. And if they don't get to a bowl, that also ends their winning yeah. season streak all simultaneously. So a lot riding on the line as they move to this final week of the regular season. You did also predict last week that Michigan would win big over Northwestern. And I'm not sure if you anticipated a 44 point victory but that's yeah. exactly what we got out of the wolverines last week yeah, yeah I, I i did think that they would that they would win convincingly and now this was close at halftime it wasn't a blowout but michigan outscored them 33 to nothing in the second half they got their running game going their defense was for the second week in a row their defense really showed up and played well um uh, you know they held 
a 201 to 11 advantage in running the football, which, you know, is definitely the way Michigan wants to play. They had six sacks, eight tackles for loss on the defensive side of the ball. So uh, an impressive win for Michigan and, and probably a, you know, as big of a confidence boost as they could ask for going into the big game this weekend in Columbus. No question. Uh, here's a question for you though. When's the last time you described USC UCLA as a defensive rock <laughs> fight? Because yeah. it feels like that's kind of what we got. 19-13, the final score in favor of the Trojans. And somewhat fitting that the defensive coordinator that was at UCLA yeah. moves to USC, gets the final lap here. Yeah, it is. You know, this is this is a, a great rivalry. Obviously, the first this is the first time it's been a two Big Ten teams playing in this rival. They've always been Pac-12 rivals, crosstown rivals. The beautiful uniforms, both settings, both stadiums are outstanding settings for college football. Um, but yeah, low scoring, uh, low scoring ball game, 1913. And it's funny because this is the fifth straight year that the road team has won the game in this yeah. series, which uh, yeah, I think is kind of interesting. And the thing I wasn't even aware of, and maybe you knew this, but during the week, I mean, USC had a lot to overcome this week. On Tuesday, they had 27 players and staff members miss practice because of the flu. So they were kind of battling it uphill all week to just get to the game. And then, uh, again, second uh, second game in a row for the new starting quarterback, Maeva, who put up some good numbers. And so uh, a, a nice confidence-boosting win for Lincoln Riley's team, too, as they get ready for a big rivalry game uh, to host this weekend. Yeah, huge game, obviously, against Notre Dame which will be just fun to watch always is between those two programs. And similar to this one, you kind of throw the records out because anything can happen. And we saw last year, USC came in as the more touted team and, and just got completely curb stomped in South Bend. So we'll take a look at that as we do look at some of our rivalry week previews for yeah. week 14, Nebraska at Iowa. This is Friday, NBC and Peacock, seven 30, a black Friday game between these two. You know, it, it feels like there's some level of pressure that's off for the corn huskers at this point yeah. now getting that sixth win getting that monkey off their back you know iowa no no Cade mcnamara it sounds like he'll be done for the potential mm. ever i guess but yeah. foreseeable future at minimum but yeah nebraska at iowa is always a, a fun matchup not necessarily a ton of points that are going to be yeah. scored but certainly something that could be back and forth between these two yeah i, I know nebraska scored 44 last week against wisconsin but i think this will be another one of your rock fights Yes. Uh, in, in this one, two two teams that are going to lean hard on their defense. Don't know what the weather is going to be like in Iowa City. Uh, probably cold, you know, but uh, an important game for both teams. You know, I mean, Iowa's had they just had a weird season. At times, they've looked really good. You know, when we've talked to Kirk Ferentz. He he talked about the maturity of the team, the inconsistency of the team, and man, we have seen that. You know, you look at them their last five games. I mean, they beat Maryland, they beat Wisconsin, they beat Northwestern, they lost to UCLA, they lost to Michigan State. You know, so it's a very unpredictable season for them. Yeah. Uh, I will say this, they definitely play better at home than they do on the road. So uh, the fact that they're hosting this game, I think, is big for the Hawkeyes. 1,000%. We'll take a look at the big one, the game, Michigan at Ohio State. Obviously different than the last three seasons where it felt like the winner of this one was going to gain everything, and the loser was going to lose just about everything. There was right. one year a couple right. of years ago, I guess, what would that yeah. have been, two years ago, where they both end up in the college football playoff anyway, both lose in the college football playoff semifinal. It just felt like there was everything on the line yeah. for both teams. Now, this year, there's everything on the line for one team, right. but it doesn't take away from the lore that is this matchup and right. what we'll expect to see on Saturday. Yeah, and you would expect that we'll see the best version of Michigan that they're capable of playing at yeah. this this week. You know, and they again, they still have a talented football team, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. And and if their defensive front can play the way they've played the last couple of weeks. And I remember a couple of weeks ago, they didn't beat Indiana, but they played Indiana really well. And yep. in the second half, particularly, their defense really stopped and, and kind of stymied Indiana's offense. So uh, they're going to have to lean hard on their defense. Super underdogs coming into this game. You know, Sharon Moore, his first year as the head coach at Michigan, this will be the most least pressurized 
Ohio State and Michigan <laughs> game that he will ever experience as the head coach at Michigan, right? The expectation is not there for him this year, but that'll change after one of these games. Ryan Day has been living that life, you know, forever, right? Three years in a row, they have not beaten Michigan. They have to beat Michigan this year. Uh, and, and you can say, well, you know, the college football playoff, Big Ten championship, that's the most important. No, this is the most important thing right now for Ryan Day and for Ohio State. For all those guys that came back for that could have gone to the NFL, that came back for another year at Ohio State, all of that starts this Saturday in beating Michigan. None of them have done it. I mean, that's yeah. that's where you start. You look at a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. He never did in his yeah. career. Never played for a Big Ten championship in a Big Ten championship game. That's hard to believe, given the yeah. talent that they've had the last couple of years, and that's the reason for the the level of money they spent this offseason yeah. to bring and put this roster together, to bring in Chip Kelly as the offensive coordinator, to retain Jim Knowles as the defensive coordinator. All of it leads to this crescendo of a moment this weekend against Michigan. And I'll never forget what Joshua Perry told us last season. He said the year before, if you remember, they they were a play away. I mean, a, a missed field goal away from beating Georgia, who would go on to win right. the national championship, who would go on to beat TCU in a drubbing. I know you were there for that. The, the aspect of that game, Joshua said they could have won that game against Georgia. They could have beaten TCU. And most people in Columbus would have still viewed the season as a failure because they lost to Michigan. Yeah, That's how much this one means. It seems like an exaggeration, but having been a, a resident of Ohio for most of my life, uh, I know that that's the reality. It's you know? true. So It is true. So, uh, And you know what? We talked about Notre Dame playing their best at this time of year. Penn State playing their best this time of year. What you want to do as you are moving towards – championship weeks and playoffs, Ohio State's playing their best football right now. Yeah. Defensively, they have really turned the switch and become more aggressive, more attacking, making plays on the other line of scrimmage. Uh, and then offensively, I mean, you know, it's kind of like this: what we saw with Riley Leonard. The more he plays and the more he and Mike Denbrock work together, the better they look. Same thing with Will Howard and Chip Kelly. The more they play together, I mean, he is really efficient, you know, and – there's a lot of talk about a lot of quarterbacks in the country that are that are playing really well. But if you look at the numbers and just the efficiency, nobody's playing any better than Will Howard right now no as, a, as a thrower, as a leader, as a runner, as a touchdown producer. Uh, you know, he, he's played really, really well. And he's well, a great leader. You can see that that the team really respects his leadership and his maturity on the field. You could you could get that vibe even when we were meeting with him on a Zoom call, just the guys walking past, stopping, mm -hmm. interacting. They have the utmost respect for him yeah. and vice versa. And so I think you've seen that in the big moments this year. You mentioned Riley Leonard and Mike Denbrock leads us to Notre Dame and USC. We brought up this matchup, how important it is. This will be 3.30 on Saturday on CBS. And there's so much at stake, again, yeah. for Notre Dame. But we got to see them two of the last three weeks, and it just feels like they've recognized they've been in playoff football mode since they lost week two yeah. against Northern Illinois. It has been all worth every second for them upholding the pain of that loss. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they've done a great job of that. I think they've remained very focused. I think they've improved on a weekly basis. Uh and they've got so much to play for, right? And yeah. They can't afford another loss uh, yeah. if they want to make it into the playoffs. So they've got to win out. You know, USC, it, it, they're basically playing to be a spoiler in a rivalry game to maybe improve what bowl game they might get to because they're 6-5 and five right now. They could move to 7-5 and five with a win. Here's what I'll say, though. Um, Notre Dame has won now, what, nine games in a row? Is that yes. right? nine games in a row, this will be the most talented team that they've played in this 10-game stretch, hmm. in my opinion, okay? The USC, even though they're sitting there at six and five, is a very talented football team on both sides of the ball. And I think that, you know, it'll be very important for Notre Dame to remain focused and to start fast. You know, we saw them start fast in both the games that we did of theirs in the last couple of weeks, and it'll be just as important on the road to start fast against USC in this one and to kind of very early on make USC feel like, okay, we're, we're in over our heads right now. Another game that has some major implications in the big 10. And again, 
there are still a couple teams that are vying for that Big Ten championship spot. Oregon's already booked their ticket, but Indiana's still alive should Ohio State lose this week. They've got Purdue at home. On paper, you say this is as lopsided as it gets. Purdue's been one of the the poor teams, not just in the conference, but potentially in the entire country. And obviously Indiana looking for some semblance of bounce back after what happened last week against Ohio State. But again, it's a rivalry game and a lot can happen. And who knows what a boomerang loss looks like, especially for a team that had been riding such a high and got hit in the mouth last week. Well, and this is, I think, where we'll see and we'll we'll feel, you know, how good of a coach and a leader Kurt Signetti is because, you know, he's going to have this team ready to go back and ready to play. And I will be very surprised if they don't if they don't really beat the doors off of Purdue in this rivalry game. They just got so much still ahead of them, so yep. much in front of them. Uh, a lot of people questioning whether they should be a college football playoff team or not because they hadn't really played a very good schedule. And then in their biggest game, they didn't, they didn't really play the part. Uh, so I think they want to come out and, and, and reestablish themselves as one of the elite teams in college football this year. And, and man, seriously, for our friend Craig Van Meter's sake, you know, we kind of need Indiana to show up and play well because uh, we can't afford for Craig to, uh, to have two weeks in a row where it's heartache. No, we need full Craigatron yes, in, his, in his Optimus Prime type of form. So we'll, <laughs> see, we'll see what that looks like this weekend. A couple others that have some other implications. The other team that's vying for a spot in the Big Ten championship game would be Penn State. Yep. They've got Maryland at home Saturday, 3.30 on Big Ten Network. They can also, uh, I, I don't want to say completely clinch, but they will essentially clinch a college football playoff berth if they win this game. They'll have one loss on the season. It'll be to Ohio State. Outside of that, they've been yep. almost perfect. Obviously, they've had some tough ones. USC, they had to find a way. Minnesota last week, they had to find a way. And we've talked about Maryland's offense. I know Billy Edwards got hurt last yep. week in the game, and we'll see what his status looks like. But Tyler Warren's been excellent. Drew Aller has been big in, in the big moments necessary. The two running backs, obviously, are fantastic. The defense is off the charts. It just feels like, as you talked about earlier, they're, they're finding their stride when they need to find yep. their stride. Yeah, they are, you know, and, and right now what they're playing for is is momentum, confidence, and another home game after this. I mean, that, sure. that's, you know, they're going to have to sit out, probably they'll sit out the Big Ten championship game in all likelihood, but they could have another game and should probably have another game at home yep. hosting a college football playoff game if they take care of business on Saturday against Maryland. Our game is going to be in the Pacific Northwest. The one team that we know is going to be in the Big Ten Championship is number one, Oregon. The only undefeated team now left in all of FBS after Army and Indiana lost this past week. They've got Washington. Washington has beaten them, what, the last three times now? And it has been close to the final whistle, all three of them. These two teams were two of the elite teams in the Pac-12 the last couple of years. Oregon is trying to to cap off a perfect regular season. Washington is trying to play some level of spoiler to that. They have gotten bowl eligibility in Jed Fish's first year, which is impressive of a turnaround as they're going to find, considering how much he lost from last year's roster, the turnover that they've had to endure. But this one should be fun. I'm looking forward to it because we know Austin's going to be loud and and everybody's going to be excited for it. And look, this is as good of a rivalry as you're going to find, especially on the West Coast. Yeah, and that's what, you know, people watching this podcast, Big Ten football fans, you know, these two teams are two of the new ones coming in, right? And UCLA and USC played their rivalry game last week, that crosstown rivalry. This is one of the most intense rivalries in college football. The fan bases of Washington and Oregon do not like each other no. at all. Former players do not like each other. So so uh, you, you, a lot of times you don't think of those kind of rivalries on the West Coast, think everybody's laid back and cool and hanging out at the beach. No, these teams do not like each other, and it shows, it, it boils over, much like an Ohio State-Michigan, much like an Alabama-Auburn kind of game. And it has that kind of feel to it. Uh, and Oregon, you know, they've got their sights set on where they're going. Yep. Indianapolis and then the college football playoffs, uh, you know, and, and they want to have a bye that first week. All of that's right in front of them. But they've got to beat a team that is is sneaky good. Yep. Uh, you know, Washington is sneaky good. First of all, they're very good on defense. I mean, Steve Belichick has done a really nice job with the roster that they put together defensively. 
they're they're a very stingy defense. Um, and then offensively, a lot of that just depends on the quarterback. You know, if Will Rogers is the starter, is he going to take care of the football? Is he hot? Or do they go to the youngster who has played really well when he's come into games? Uh, you know, we'll find that out as this week progresses. But whoever plays that position is going to have to play well and take care of the football uh, going into Autzen Stadium. But Oregon is, I mean, they're rolling. I mean, both teams are coming off a bye. I think I read where Dan Lanning didn't call it, doesn't call it a bye week. He calls it an improvement week. Yep. You know, he's always, they're always pushing the buttons of how can we get better? How can we keep a growth mindset? How can we be a better version of ourselves? And, uh, you know, they're, they're an impressive football team that plays extremely well at home. No question. And Damon Williams, to your point, he's the guy of the future at Washington. Yeah. They expect him to be the starter of the next couple of years. Potentially they have, limit unlimited belief in what his skill set will be yeah. within the offense they've got will rogers has played a lot of football he's had some moments this year where he's looked really good he's had some other moments where he right. hasn't looked quite as good so it'll be interesting to see how all that comes together come saturday night but again that'll be nbc 7 30 eastern nbc and peacock we'll have all the coverage of that so here here are the scenarios in the big 10 championship game and then college football playoff implications beyond that but Ohio State, Penn State, Indiana are all still alive. Ohio State is in if they win, so they control it. Or if Indiana or Penn State lose, they're also in. Indiana needs a win, and then Ohio State and Penn State losses. And Penn State would need a win and an Ohio State loss. So Indiana yeah. would be the least likely. Penn State second. Ohio State would be number one. It would, a, a, a second loss could really potentially hurt all three. I mean, certainly Indiana. If, if they lose again here, their college football right. playoff chances are, are as good right. as gone. Right. The other two might have afforded themselves a chance to lose, but it could be difficult to overcome that if yeah. you do lose this final week with the college football playoff looming. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, we saw a lot of chaos come out of the SEC this past yeah. weekend. You know, so there's a lot of talk about the two lost teams, the three lost teams in the SEC. So it's going to be a similar kind of week, at least going into it for these Big Ten teams. Uh, but if they take care of business, um, you know, the, the teams that should be in the playoffs probably will be. And the two teams that should be playing a rematch in the Big Ten championship game probably will be. Yeah. Let's go to Xfinity Big Connections. And that is the Heroes game. We brought it up earlier, but Nebraska and Iowa, great rivalry. First meeting, 1891. It was Iowa's first ever game played Outside of the state, exclusive trains ran between Iowa City and Lincoln to allow for fans to travel to the game, and Iowa won it 22 nothing. But Nebraska leads the all-time series 30-21 and three ties. Heroes Trophy was introduced when Nebraska moved to the Big Ten in 2011. The Heroes game recognizes individuals from each state for heroism in their communities. Iowa does lead the trophy series 9-4. to and has won eight of the last nine, including an ugly victory last year with Deacon Hill and company securing another double-digit win season. But we expect this to be a fun matchup. Yeah. Well, uh, again, we'll be curious what both teams look like at this point of the season. But you know there's going to be some level of bad blood between the two of them. Yeah, and, and there'll definitely be a high level of physicality. These are yep. two very physical football teams, uh, like to play and win games the same way. Uh, and, and really, look, I, it's it's good for college football when both of these teams are good. You yes. know, not just the Big Ten. I mean, college football in general, because they're two iconic brands. They're outstanding fan bases, cool stadiums, really fun places for us to go do a game, whether it's yep. Lincoln or Iowa City. So uh, so it'll be a fun one. It'll, it'll be a fun. And I'm glad the game's on Friday because we'll get to watch a good portion of that since our game is on Saturday night. I like where your head's at. Time for some fan submitted questions presented by Xfinity. First question this week, which Big Ten team is the most primed for a playoff run? The most primed for a playoff run? Um, well, I, look, I'm going to say Ohio State right now just because I think they're playing their best football. I think they have that loss that, that stayed with them. And, you know, they, they haven't lost the taste of that. And they've gotten better and better and better. And particularly defensively, they, they are playing with uh, kind of reckless abandon right now that they weren't maybe playing with earlier in the year. And so I would say they're most primed right now. Uh, and they're playing the way everybody expected them to be playing 
uh, when this season started. I'm going to agree with you. I also think that they are just, if, if you're going on paper, the most talented team yeah. in the country. They have yeah. the most talent on their roster and obviously an excellent coaching staff on top of it, which leads us to our next question. Is Ryan Day's job security at risk if Ohio State loses to Michigan? I think that the wording is probably unfair, yeah. but I would say murmurs potentially. There might be some some chatter if that were to happen. There definitely would be chatter if that happens. Again, just being from Ohio and, and you know, you're talking about what Joshua said to us, you know, before. I mean, it's almost inconceivable to think that they could lose four years in a row to Michigan. Yes. Now, I know, you know, when, when Urban was there, I mean, they were doing that to Jim Harbaugh, doing that to Michigan. But, uh, you know, that, I, that, that tide has got to change for Ryan Day and for – Ohio State, you know, and for those guys that came back, I just, it will be a monumental upset if Michigan wins the game. Now, I do think Michigan will compete. I think they'll play physical and play tough, and it'll be the rivalry that it is. But Ohio State just has too much for them. Most important question submitted this week. What's your favorite Thanksgiving side dish? Wow. Uh, well, I – I like dressing. I like stuffing, dressing, however you want to call it. I think they call it really different parts. Yeah, I, I really like that with with gravy on top of it. You know, because I just, I mean, look, turkey and dressing is and is something I don't. I, mean, I eat that once a year and I'm good. I don't need to eat it any other time. So I kind of load up on on those things. On those mm. two. Things. Yeah. How about you? So it's, it's a tough decision between mac and cheese and mashed potatoes. But if my actual answer were, because the, the problem is my actual answer is very specific to something my mom made. I think uh -huh. I've told you about this, but my, my favorite thing she ever made was called cornbread casserole. And that was a mm -hmm. Thanksgiving specific thing. Yeah, and I was, she would have to make two full pot or, or whatever you want <laughs> to call, yeah. I guess, full pan of them and I would have to I would eat an entire pan by myself <laughs> and everyone else would get the second pan. It's awesome. So that would be my official answer. But either way, you can submit your questions to the show every week using hashtag big talk. Uh fun week ahead, final week of the regular season yeah. coming to a close here, man. Yeah, and you know what? I and we don't we normally just stay focused on the Big Ten, but it's such a fun week this last week of the regular season. And some of these games that are going to be played, I mean Texas at Texas A&M, a, a rekindling of a rivalry, a very intense rivalry for a lot at stake, particularly for Texas. You know, I mean, Texas A&M may have played themselves out of playoff contention uh, with their loss last week uh, to Auburn, but but still a rekindling of an incredible rivalry. Uh, Arizona State, I mean, they're 9-2. and two. They play at Arizona. You know, they're very much in the, in the race for the, the new Big 12. Uh, Cal, who, who came off of their win against Stanford, they're bowl eligible. They go to SMU, who's 10 and 1. SMU, very much in the picture of the ACC, you know, uh, winning the ACC. I just think it's cool. Miami is the other team that's like that. They play your alma mater, and that won't right. be an easy game for Miami going to 8 and 3 Syracuse and playing this week. So uh, a lot at stake of that. Clemson's still kind of, I guess, in the hunt there at 9 and 2. They host South Carolina in their, their annual, uh, I think that's the uh, Palmetto Bowl, they call that, because uh, because of the state uh, of South Carolina. But then even on Friday, not just our Nebraska and Iowa game, Georgia Tech plays at Georgia. You know, Georgia Tech's 7-4. and four. That's It's funny, you talk to some Georgia fans, what's the biggest rivalry that Georgia plays? A lot of it depends on what part of the state you live in whether it's Florida, whether it's Tennessee. Uh, but the old school Georgia fans will always say Georgia Tech is our number one rivalry, even though they're not in the same league. It's that interstate game. Uh, Oregon State plays at Boise State, you know, and kind of keeping an eye on Boise as that higher ranked non-Power Four conference team. Uh, but they play Oregon State, which is a Power Four team or Power Two or whatever conference they're in. And then <laughs> – Here's another good game. This is a great game on Friday, uh, or this one's on Thursday. Memphis, who's nine and two, plays at Tulane, who's nine and two. Mm. Tulane and Army will play in the AAC championship game. So, I mean, Tulane, you know, they're ranked number twenty right now. Depending on if there's an upset of Boise, if there's other things that happen, Tulane could find themselves 
you know, with a chance to, to get in there as well. So a lot of games, a lot of significance. The fact that there's 12 playoff teams, uh, you know, that's why so many of these games have a lot of meaning more yeah, like than matters. just being rivalry games, right? You said it, our first episode of the season, this is going to be one of the most memorable and chaotic seasons in all of college football, certainly in recent memory. It has delivered as such, and this week should be no exception to that. We appreciate you for tuning in to Big Talk with Todd and Noah presented by Xfinity. Don't forget to like, subscribe, download on the NBC Sports YouTube channel wherever you get your audio podcasts. And as always, we will talk to you next week. Happy Thanksgiving.